All right, welcome back to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. We're on week nine of the class, the final week of the semester. We've got two more days left of coding and then the final assignment due. So just to look at everything one last time uh, based on the calendar and so forth. So if today is the 31st, the last day of July, August begins tomorrow. Then we've got our final day of lecture on Wednesday. And the assignment, the final project has been given since last week. And the final deadline for that is the 6th, so August 6th. And as one more reminder, I cannot take that late. You have to turn it in by that final deadline, whereas other deadlines had a little bit of leeway. This is the one that doesn't have any leeway because it is the end of the line. So make sure you've got it turned in. Make sure you've got any other late work turned in as well. If you still want to get some amount of credit, if you missed an assignment, you can still turn it in. You can still get some credit up to seven points, uh, but that's better than zero points. So just be aware of that final, final deadline. Quick overview here in the uh, finals week. So, in the resources, we will use this on Wednesday, maybe today, we'll see. But I have here this uh, zip file full of sounds. We may get to it today, we may not, definitely Wednesday. But we'll, the final part of the project will be to add sound to the project. So I've got some starting point sounds, a couple of background soundtracks, and a couple of sound effects. So you're welcome to use these for your final project or find your own, use your own. As I've got listed here, Pixabay not only is full of a variety of royalty-free images, but if you search here, instead of images, if you search for music or sound effects, there will be music and sound effects there that you can use on your final project. You've also got the free music archive. You can go there. But I've got the, the I've got this zip file of uh, music that we will use definitely on Wednesday. And uh, the, uh, the Wednesday will be the, uh, the day that I definitely talk about music. And today, uh, we're probably going to do a little bit of coding. Uh, we might get to the music coding definitely today. But that is then in um, the goals for this week. So final game project doing the six 20 points and i've got a couple of other things to talk about besides class stuff but the coding parts the main stuff today so let me get directly into the coding you should load up your project from before i'm going to start with my starting point from last time and add to it you're welcome to do that as well this is another way to succeed here that if you take my starting point and add to it that's perfectly viable. I know several people want to start uh, completely from zero and then do their project that way. That's perfectly fine. I, I like that, although it is a lot of work because you have to do everything completely from zero. Uh, and you have to go by the you have to go by the lectures to make sure it all works. So just need to set myself up here. Got a brand new day project to work on. Be one. Set up also the Android settings one more time. Every time you load it up, you might have to set your settings just because it might forget them uh, here at the lab, of course. But at home, all your settings will be remembered.
So if all of that is properly saved, I should then be able to debug my project just to remind us where we're at. We've been exploring these various rooms of this scary haunted house. And again, on your own projects, you are continuing what you've done in your animated project. So I can't wait to see what you'll be doing on your own projects. In here. Start, I'm on the main gate, open the gate. We're on the front of the house. Get those interactive elements. Part of what we'll do with sound is add sound of the tree falling over and the glass breaking and all of that, but that'll be Wednesday. Get in through the window. We have the left and the right. So obviously we've seen all of this. If you defeat the creature in time, you can do the good ending. Obviously to put the polish on this, once you defeat the um, mini boss, you could have it animated so that it falls down and it makes a noise. It does something, mine just disappears. But to put polish on it, you should have it um, be defeated. And then you can go to the actual exit. Now on, the, on this good ending, we're at the good ending. This is a dead end in the game so far, of course, right? What if I want to restart? What if I want to quit the game, et cetera? So we'll program that today. Uh, I get to the end of the game. I want to start over. Right now I have to stop the simulator and start it again. I want to add a restart game or quit game. So we'll add that. And before that, we have another room. We have the left room to go to. Get in, we go to the left. The moment, there's no left room just yet. I'm getting an error. There's no such place as left. We haven't made the left room yet. So we'll focus on the left room. What's gonna happen on the left room is a brand new idea. We're gonna introduce the concept of randomness to the game. There's going to be uh, a hallway and there's gonna be a door and you wanna get into the door and randomly when you get into that room, there'll be a bunch of keys on the floor. And every time you play, the keys will be in a random spot. So one of those keys is gonna be the right key to pick up to be able to um, get to the next room, to get out of that room. Well, okay, where, where's the danger? When you get to that left room, you're gonna have spikes starting to come out of the walls and such. So a time limit, just like we had the mini boss, you had to defeat the mini boss within the time to then be able to go to the next room. On the key room, there's spikes coming. So within the amount of time, you have to get the right key. And so randomly, we're gonna introduce some random elements that change as people play the game. So setting ourselves up in the project, we are at hall main. Go either to the right hall or to the left hall. Our code there is set up. If you hit the, if you if you tap the hit state, the hit spot for the hall to the right, go to the right. If you want to go to the left, there it is. Now it's not fully set up. In my case, I just have some placeholder text. We've got a button to go to the left. Run the function, go to the left etc. But it's not the correct name names of things. So in the scenes, hall left is where I need to go. So your code so your code here, after successfully detecting pressing the button to go left, you're going to run a function. We will call it fn go to hall left. So I'm keeping that name consistent with the previous code. Function go to hall left. Then of course, on the next line, I define that that function 
is named there. I have my little output here to let me know that this code is properly running. I have a note in the code to not lose track of that curly brace. This is the end of that code. And then of course, line 16 or so, where am I actually going? Frame one of that other scene. So scene hall left. Quick test if you want. Just to make sure that there is no error in the code. Go left, not the left. All right, so on this left hallway, we're gonna do something similar to the right hallway where there's gonna be a long hallway, then at the end there's a door and we'll set up the randomness of this scene. So hall left, there's a little placeholder there. Remove that, I'm going to draw in um, draw. Something vaguely like this. There's a door off on the distance. There's a hallway that we're going to go towards. Down here, near you, near where the camera is, some keys will appear here randomly. Every time you play the game, they'll appear here. Obviously, everything that I'm showing as we learn this, this game, um, is ingredients. These are pieces of ideas that you, then you can put together when you do your own version of the game. So here we're gonna talk about uh, several cool things. Um, from the library, we can dynamically grab something from the library and put it on the screen anywhere we want. Multiple copies of a thing, grab it out of the library, put it on screen through code. Through code, we can also put it randomly in different places on the scene, not just in the same place every time, but random places in the, on the screen. And also, I'll introduce the concept of using uh, a main sprite uh, or sprite sheet, sometimes it's called, where it's one object, but the one object is full of different frames or different um, versions of a thing. And then you view the one that is important at that moment. So we're gonna have, just for practice, we're gonna have three keys. We're gonna have four different keys or 10 different keys. We're gonna have three keys, three slightly differently designed keys. All three of them will exist in one symbol. So instead of making three different symbols of three different keys, it might be more efficient to have one key symbol, three different frames, three different key drawings, and then when we load them on the screen, it'll be a different one of those drawings. So a little bit more complexity. What I'm gonna to do to start off with, I'm gonna draw one key on the, on the ground. However you wanna draw a key, I'm just gonna draw one of these like really vintage types of keys, something like that. I don't know, I'll draw it better later, but I'll draw a key on the floor, maybe also rotate it or something. So just draw something on the floor somewhere, somewhere, somewhere sort of near us in the camera, somewhere. We'll place it dynamically via code and the like. But I just wanna draw a key to start off with. I'm gonna convert it to a symbol. So as soon as you draw it, F8, select it and then F8 or right click, uh, convert to symbol, call it left keys, left, left, uh, 
But Hall, Hall left. Keys. Again, I'm grouping my various names here. Everything regarding the right, Hall right mini boss, Hall right door. Here we have Hall left keys. Registration point, usually in the center. Hall left keys. So the, the instance of it on the stage, we, we don't actually need it. But I wanted to draw a key in the right size and the right perspective. So I drew it on the scene so I can tell how big it is. If you had gone through the route of creating a symbol and then drawing the key there, you don't have a very good perspective on how big to make the thing. And then when you put it on the stage, it might be too big, too small. You have to do the extra step of resizing it. I drew it in the scene, then turned it to the symbol so that I know what size it is. So I no longer need a copy of it, delete it, but obviously we still got it in the library. So in the library, double click it in the library to edit it. And the key is right there in the center of my stage. And I'm on frame one and I have one key. I'm gonna make a new symbol or sorry, a new frame, frame two, F7, and draw a different type of a key, maybe one with a, a skull on it. And then I'll make a new frame, frame three, F7, draw a different design of a key. So three slightly different looking keys on their own frame. And all three of these are in the one symbol. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. Go to frame two, F7. I wanna draw a new key. Well, I don't know how big to draw it. Remember, you can turn on your onion skinning here. So you can see your previous frame. Whoops, that's gonna to be too big. So with your onion skinning on, you have an idea of how big to draw the other key. And you can draw it in the exact same position or another position or whatever, but I'm gonna draw another key. So let's say this one will be, I don't know, something like this, like a vertical one. Different shape on the top here. Find it perfectly later. Frame one, one key. Frame two, another key. Frame three, F7, draw a third key. Now, this concept that we're doing here, again, it's a sprite sheet. It's one symbol with multiple instances of, of a thing. Maybe this is, this is your weapons symbol. And I've got seven weapons, a sword and a shield and a staff and, um, and so forth. And they're all grouped into one symbol. Via the code, I can then load any particular symbol or frame that I want to uh, display it on screen. But you have to do the setup of drawing the things. So let's see, one more key. Um, inspiration right here out of my own real keys. They all kind of look the same. How about one with a um, angle. I have a whole, like a loop I, for a loop, I guess. So we have these three different keys. Back to my scene. All right, so I have a symbol with multiple sprites. In order for the code, to know that I'm interacting with something so far, we have used instance names, right? If I go back to any other example over here, this start button has a property of an instance name. Well, instance names work 
when the object is on the screen. It exists and I can give it an instance name so that the code knows what I'm, what I'm dealing with. We're gonna do something different here. We're going to grab an object from the library to put it onto the, onto the stage and it needs an instance name. And it's done slightly different here. The name of it, I, I don't like that the names are slightly different, so it's confusing. But in the library, it's called linkage. So it would have been nice that in the library, you've got the name of the symbol, and then you've got its instance name. So consider here linkage as instance name. So we can add an instance name in the library, and therefore the code will know what are we talking about in the library, grab it from the library, put it on screen. In order to add an instance name to it in the library, you have to right-click it. So the, those keys that you just drew, right-click it and go to properties. Right-click properties. This takes us back to the screen we've seen before, but now we're gonna look at the advanced part of the properties. It brings up this big advanced part over here. Here's what we care about, action script linkage, action script instance name in a sense. Within this group here, turn on the export for action script. It'll automatically say export frame one, that's fine, leave it as is. It'll automatically fill in class and base class, this is all fine. Here's the instance name, hall left keys. So that's fine. Nothing to change here. The important thing to do is under the advanced, just turn that on. These can be changed. This can be called anything you want. The default is perfectly fine. So those both turn on. These names are default. Good. Click OK. It'll pop up to say, OK, this thing doesn't exist yet. Would you like us to invent it? Yes. Click OK. And now on the side over here, we looked at these columns. We have linkage and use count. So this is the only symbol that has a linkage that has an instance name. Notice this is also interesting. How many times are you using this throughout your, your project? So the mini boss was used three times, huh? I guess for the, uh, oh yeah, it is three times because it's on three different frames when it moves. But anyway, so Hall Keys now has a linkage and use count. So now let's write some code to make it appear on screen. Under your actions, hallway, Left hall is our code so far. So note, uh, create instance of the first key. Remember, we've got three keys in the symbol. Well, we have to write a little bit of code for each one of them. VAR, this is a variable. Variables are very powerful in most programming languages. They're a container. They can contain a number, a letter, a word. They can contain a reference or a path or a connection to the library. We're creating a variable. I'm going to call this key one. So if I want three keys, eventually I'll do key one, two, three. If I want 10 keys, give them all a name. If I want more advanced, uh, creation, I have to write more code. But anyway, key, key one, colon. And normally you will write something like, okay, number, this variable is going to hold a number, or this variable is going to hold a string, or this variable is going to hold a type of data. What we want here is the linkage name. This variable is going to hold a type of this symbol. So colon, hall, left keys. Make sure you type it exactly as the name is in the linkage here. You can, you can double click it here and copy it to save 
some effort. So colon hall keys, make sure that's exactly as, at the, as the name is here. So now this variable is going to hold this type of data equal to base hall keys left again, parentheses, semicolon. So all of this, what's doing is it's putting into memory one copy of that symbol. That's what all of this code is doing. Here will be the specific version of that, and the rest is just necessary code. It's in memory, but it's not on the screen yet. To the screen. Code, add child, parentheses. This is the code to put something actually on the screen, key one. You're making one key. The definition of the key is all of that. And then we're putting it on the screen. Easy. Well, again, computers are dumb. Where on the screen? In the center, on the bottom, near the door, where? So we have to add position, the new key. The name of the object, key1.x equal to some pixel value. Let's just put 100 for the moment. Dot y equals 100. So everything is defined in x, y coordinates from the top left of the game. The very, very, very top left over here is 0, 0. Move to the right 100 pixels and move down 100 pixels. So my code is saying so far. We'll refine it in a moment. Now I'm positioning it somewhere on the screen. Uh, if we do a quick uh, control test scene, that should be good enough. We don't have to play the game. We just control test scene so I can see it. A couple of things. It's placed where I told it, 100 by 100, and I happen to draw it in a way that it looks like it's spinning. But it's cycling through every single drawing. My symbol has three drawings, frame one, two, three. So it's going to do what timelines do. They automatically play. It looks like my key is spinning. That's kind of interesting. So I've got to fix my position in a moment. But more importantly now, and set which, which key slash sprite slash frame to display. Got three to choose from. I want to show the first key. All right, one dot, go to and stop, frame one. This is cool. We can have the control of jumping between timelines, not just in the main game, but in a symbol, simply by saying, here's this object. We're going to go and stop at a particular frame, frame one. If I save that. Test the scene. No longer spinning, no longer cycling through all of the frames. Just to refine the position here a little bit better. Um, view. There's. So it's like maybe somewhere, somewhere around here, this seems to be somewhere like 100 by 400. So just to kind of pick for the moment a place, of course, we'll have it random in a moment, but at approximately 100, 400. by 400, x is left and right, y is up and down. Probably push it down a little bit more in a moment, but let me pause here. So 
Any questions so far? Is that working for all of you? Anyone having any trouble at this point? This is very cool at this point. If you have it working so far, you're grabbing something out of the library, putting it on the screen, positioning it where you want, showing one of a specific frame on the screen, all through code. This is, uh, this is one of the coolest things that I like about programming and such that um, uh, it, it can let you do anything. Anything that you can do with a mouse, you can do via code and very precisely and repeatedly. That's one of the things that computers are very good at, repetition. As we will see in a moment, you know, put seven keys on the screen for me and put them in different places. Once you program the algorithm, basically what is the necessary code, that's the algorithm. Once you program the necessary code, it'll just do it. Computers are very good at following directions. That's what they were invented for. I think I wanna move it down slightly more in my case, maybe 450, sure. We'll make this random in a moment. Right now we're placing something specific. We'll do keys two and three randomly. This is for you to know how the basic process is. Then we will do the random keys. And then I would recommend you go back and change that one to be random after you learn how to do random. So let me go on. For random, I need to deal with random number generators. I see a hallway. I drew a hallway. But what Adobe Animate sees is just coordinates, X and Y coordinates. And let's say in my case, let me remove these guides here, view guides clear. Let's say I want randomly keys to appear, but not 100% not random. I don't want a key to appear over here or up here on the roof or way over here. I could if I wanted, depending on what you're doing on your own game. What I want is the keys to appear somewhere here near me. Let's say I'm standing here, right? So if I'm far off over here, I want the keys to appear somewhere near me down here. So there's sort of, a, there's sort of an area or a range somewhere around here. That I want the keys to, to appear in. So I'll have to do a little bit of math in a moment, but if I if I set up rulers, view rulers, and temporarily I put a guide like maybe somewhere here, which is around 50. So from 50, so anywhere between 50 and let's say somewhere over here, I don't know, 650. So X and Y somewhere within here, not all the way to the left, not all the way to the right. somewhere around here, between 50 and 650. And then vertically, well, let's see, somewhere that's around 400, maybe 425, we'll figure it out in a moment, but let's say between 400 and then down here it's 470, somewhere around there. So randomness, but within this area. I can be completely random anywhere if I want, but I want an area. So in my code, generate random numbers for positioning. R, create a new variable, a new container, a new element in memory. And these, of course, can be called anything we want. I'll call this RND, so random, RND2X, VAR, RND2Y. Now, random number, random numbers for key two, basically, then random numbers for key three. I'm starting on random two. Once you learn how to do this, you probably want to go back and then do random one. If we're gonna do more things random, okay, random seven, but I'm setting up random numbers for thing two, X coordinate and Y coordinate. We'll do three in a moment. That is equal to, sorry, uh, colon number, capital N, colon number, 
capital N. This is a container that will hold a number. This colon is explaining what will this variable hold. This variable is holding a, a thing in my library. This variable is holding a number. And then what we fill it with equals what we put into it is we're going to uh, put a, invent a random number within our boundaries. Now the random numbers that any programming language generates are usually in fractions. 1.2, 9.9997. Well, I don't want fractions of numbers, I want whole numbers. So I'm gonna round the numbers so that they are a whole number. Math, capital M, dot round, parentheses. So we'll um, take, if we, if we feed it to the number 1.3, it'll take it and make it 1.0. If we feed it to the number eight, it'll go to 2.0, right, right? Rounding up, rounding down. If we feed it 199, 0.08, it'll round down 1990. If it was uh, 1990.68, it would round up to 1991, right? This code just takes a number and rounds it up or down. The number inside of the parentheses here that we're going to generate is math.random. Careful here, uh, it does, don't lose track of these. There is open parenthesis. Again, open parenthesis, open parenthesis. Matches with that one, and this one matches with that one. Make sure all of those are the code won't work. If I put my mouse on this parenthesis, it turns blue and it finds its opening and closing. And then this one, it's opening and it's closing. So this code right here is the one that actually generates the random number, but it's gonna make you know 7.99 a fraction. Technically, it's gonna make a number between zero and one. And there are an infinite number of numbers between zero and one. Right, because half of one is one half, half of a half is one quarter, half of a quarter is one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, smaller, smaller, smaller. So there are numbers in between, there are infinite numbers between every number. And so this is picking a number between zero and one. Um, I want it to go into the range on my screen. Right, we have, um, well, we have this amount of space from left and right, which is from 50 to 65, uh, to 650. Times, so uh, asterisk, which is shift eight times 650. outside of the parentheses, but before that semicolon space plus 50. This math is picking a random number from left to right on the X coordinates, 650 to 50. Actually, it should be 600 to 50. Now here's the math. If you're not a math person, here's what's happening. We're saying anywhere between here and here. Well, the leftmost is 50. And that's why we've got the plus 50 here. Don't start all the way to the left. Start 50 pixels a little bit to the right. And then go 600 more pixels. Well, if we've already started at 50, right here, plus 600 will take us to 650. If we left it at 650, it's going to go 50 and 50 more. It's going to take us to 700. It's going to go all the way over here. I, I don't want it to go that far. I want it to go this far. So whatever your starting point, and then subtract that from your maximum, 
is that number. So now we've got a random number from left to right, from here to here. Now we need a random number from top to bottom, from here to here. This one is at 400. So same thing here, equal to math.round semicolon. The parentheses. Here, um, plus 400. But whatever the random number, start from 400 down. Okay. Generate a random number. Math dot random times some maximum. I think I said 475. 470 but I need to take into account my starting. So remember I said, you're starting, subtract that from the maximum. So 400 minus 470, it's 70. You see the logic of that. It is a little weird, but hopefully I explained it that I'm trying to do a range. This is the starting point. It's kind of backwards. You think the starting would be on the left, but that's the starting point. There's the maximum, add 70 more. That takes me ultimately to 470. Start at 50, go up to 600, 650. You can see, see what those numbers are. The trace, and say random 2x, is rand to x rand to y is y. Just to see the numbers that it generated, you can trace them. All right, so random, a random number is being generated for X and Y. I want to use those random numbers for key two. Basically what I did above here, a new variable for a new key, add it to the screen, set its X, Y positions based on the random numbers, and set it to frame two or key number two. So all that we've done previously, we'll do it again with a slight variation. So. Uh, get a second key graphic, VAR key two, but it's going to be the same item from the library. This is key two. also equal to a new instance of all my keys. Put it on the screen, add child key two. Position it somewhere, key two dot X, key two dot Y equal to, all right, this random number is going to be the position of X, not just a fixed 100 or 450, that holds a random number within my range. So it's X is rand two X. It Y is rand two dot X. And I need to show the second frame, the second key. So key two dot go to and stop. Notice the capitalization, very important. Capital A, capital S, but not a capital G, capital T. And then frame two. Frame two is where I drew my second key.
Control test scene as a quick as a quick check. Two was put over here. So randomly it, it picked a spot right there. If I uh, control test scene again, this time key two appeared near key, key one. Test it again. To the right again. So it's going to um, over there. So it's going to randomly place it upon the screen. Pause there. Did that work? Did your um, did your random stuff work here? Anyone need a little help? Is the code so far? The math part of it here is uh, you have to think about that a little bit, what your values are on your own particular games. It is very helpful. So I, I recommend it when you're working on your game, uh, view your rulers and, and make some guides there and pay attention to those numbers. And then that'll be your basis to then make your own calculations for where random stuff happens. So key three, this is again where we've got the algorithm. The algorithm is a sequence of code to get a result. The algorithm is this, all of this. We've got generate some numbers. We're gonna need to generate different numbers. We don't wanna use the same random numbers. So generate some numbers, trace them to the console. I forgot to show, well, once you actually debug it, it'll show you the console. Trace them to the console grab another copy from the library, put it on the screen, set its X and Y, set its frame. So copy and paste or do it again. Do key three. E-A-R-R-N-D random three. This is the third key, the third object. It's X coordinate. There's a number going to be here. Variable random three y coordinates. It's a number. Both of these equal to something. Both of these have math that we're going to then round. Around. What's our starting point? So let's see. In my case, what did I say it was? So starting from the top of four hundred. Actually, it's going to be the same. Uh, it's going to be all the same. It's still within going to be that boundary. Now, here's where you can change things up if you want. All my keys are going to appear in the same general area down there. Nothing can stop. Nothing will stop you for you to be random completely. Like one key will appear somewhere within this floor and another key, key will appear somewhere within this wall. Maybe I've got shelves. Maybe I drew shelves over here maybe stuff will appear over here. So I can make a region of random stuff happening on one place and another region of random stuff on another place. You're not limited to exactly what I'm doing. If you understand what I'm showing you, if you understand what I'm doing, you then are able to change it up. So it's, it's the same thing here. I'm just copying and pasting to save some effort. It's gonna be the same range. The, the thing that's different is one thing is different. Make sure that one thing is different there. Uh, random X, random Y. After those random numbers are generated for the third key, well, we need to create a new Oh, we'll trace it as well, just to see the randomness, random three X.
you will generate a new instance out of the library, the AR key three. All of that is exactly the same there. Copy and paste that. That's an old, uh, very useful technique. Copy and paste. If something works correctly the first time, you need to do it multiple times, save some effort, copy and paste. Add it to the screen. Set its X and its Y coordinates. Those are being stored in this random number variable. Careful that it's the number three. If it's if you accidentally put the number two there, it'll be the same as the previous key. So not not random. Make sure they're the same. Or sorry, make sure that their key three has its random numbers three. Lastly, key three dot go to and stop onto frame three. Show me my third key. it, test the scene. I'll test it for real on the device or on the simulator in a moment. I just want to quickly test the scene. So these, these appeared there. If I test it again, it should be a slightly different place. Key one obviously is in the exact same place every time. I'm not going to do it, but I would recommend that you do it. You know how to do it now. If you review your code, it's this chunk like this. If you can do something like that for random one, you should be able to, to get it done because obviously key one is locked into exactly those positions. If I don't want exact positions, that's why I made some random numbers. The hard part about the random number is what's my range? have to put some guides and such to, to, to give you an idea. Take a moment to do the full debug movie. I want to start from the beginning. Simulator. So start the game, open that, my output down there. Feedback, my trace on the output is all working fine. Get into the house, go to the left. They all kind of bunched up in a similar area there. And FYI, so okay, go to the left hallway is running. I'm at the left hallway. Random number two is 105 by 452. And a random three, whoops, I mistyped it there. 165, 165, I put the wrong um, Y coordinate, but it's just a trace output. So it's just FYI, but three, three keys there. If I wanted a fourth key, well, I could draw a fourth frame in my symbols. I could reuse the same one key. That's fine. They're going to have a different variable name. But if I want to reuse an existing, maybe I, I really like the way I drew number three. I do need to create um, key four random number four, add it to the screen and so forth, and just use the same frame. It'll be key four, but it'll be key frame three. And I can use the same one key multiple times. Um, I could resize something. I'm gonna put this here 
but I'm going to put it as a comment. I'm going to show it, but I'm going to then turn it off. Um, we have key three dot width and key three dot height. Guess what that does? So it um, lets you set the size of your objects. Once they exist on the screen, add child, you can then set X and Y coordinates. Then you can set width and heights of an object. I'm not gonna actually leave this code in here, but I just wanna show you. Of course, everything you can do with a mouse, you can do through code. And if I wanted that key to be that size, easily, that's easily doable via the code, just set its width and its height. Now, this that, I, that I'm showing there not only only uh, can this be done with an object that was invented through code, but this can be done with things already on the screen where we had something that we placed on the screen. This start button existed at runtime. It wasn't generated through code. This has an instance name. In my case, start underscore BTN. It is accessible via Java, uh, the action script. So via the action script, I could write code to X and Y manipulate or with and height manipulate an object that is on the screen, accessing it by, via its instance name. We also have the rotate one. I don't remember what that one is. It's probably just dot rotate or rotation. I forget what it is, but we can also rotate things with code. And that can be, all of these manipulations can be done on objects that were created via code or placed on the screen. Now we're coming up for our first break here. After the break, well, one of those keys is gonna be the correct key to actually unlock the door. And then we also need to um, set up the danger of you need to get the right key within the right time. So we'll take our break. And after that, we will set up the uh, danger time limit and then the, uh, uh, which is the right key. So here's my code. It doesn't all quite fit on the screen at once, but uh, I'll leave my code up. And again, this I'll, I'm going to comment it out. I'm not actually going to resize my keys in that weird way, but example of resizing an object via code. Just set its X and Y. I mean, it's width and height. So. Everyone there, it's 102. We'll take a break until 112. Take a moment to take a little break. We'll be back at 112. Everyone here doing all right? Anyone need some help? Because it's always going to be not exactly in the screen, however, it's a platform for me to explain to the story as long as it acts.
All right, everyone, let's go on. So the next thing that we're doing here is one of these keys is the correct key. 
And what I'm going to show is the keys will appear on the ground. You want to select one. Now, I've shown the previous code about being able to move something around and hit detection. Now, part of the way that I teach something advanced like coding is, you know, I'll walk you through the steps and show you how it's done and so forth. But if I show you how it's done, then I expect that you will be able to do your version of it. So I'm going to show the um, simply selecting the right key to proceed. I'm not going to show, well, how do I move it around and make it touch the door? Because we've done code of hit detection. So if you know how that hit detection works, if I've shown it before, you should then be able to do it. So I'm not going to do the actual move this key onto the door, but I'm going to show you the um, um, selecting the right key. So if you want it to be that you've got to select the right random key and pick it up and put it on the door, you can do it. But at the very least, well, how do I make this um, detectable? And we can do it, of course, in the various ways of um, one of those three keys is going to be the right one. Or to see how to start it off, basically, we know that a certain key will be the right one. I'm going to go first with the a certain key is going to be the right key. So the difference will be that whenever you set up your key and such and put it on the screen, you also then at that moment can activate it for interactivity. So I'm going to say key three is going to be the right key. Now, obviously, with only three keys, only three possibilities, that's not too fancy. What if I had seven keys? What if I have more things to distract me? We know we're making the game. We know we've only got like six rooms in this mansion. Shouldn't be there? Shouldn't there be like 50 more? And what about a back door? And what about the pool? And all of that. Well, of course, we can go further and further and further always. But all of these ingredients together, they can add up to something very nice as you move on. So the difference will be here, little note, add this instance theme and make it interactive. So the um, situation here is dot add event listener. Catch the event listener that we've seen before when things are interactive, but we're attaching it to the moment that the key uh, has been added to the screen. And so similar to what we've seen before then, this is based on an event, a touch event, capital T, capital E, dot specifically touch tap, I'm going to run some code after um, detecting a tap. So we've got previously when we went to the bad ending, they probably just called it FN go to bad or something. What did I call this? So on the right side, if we ended, if we didn't defeat the boss, it was... Um, See bad. No, actually, um, in uh, I'm just trying to keep my names consistent, but of course, these can be anything you want. Um, we can still go off into many, many more paths, but let's say this is now directly into the good ending. So uh, FN go to good ending. So the point here is that this third key is the correct key. They're all gonna jumble around all over the place. I don't know which one it is. If you want even more randomness, there's more randomness that could be added. Here's the third key, but it's on different places on the floor every time you play. And so this listener now, when you tap that, it runs a it runs a go to ending. Well, that needs a definition. 
what does go to go to good ending mean? So define find key function that name void curly braces. It has the event of touch event. Action script compared to JavaScript needs to be specific. This function is running because of an event, specifically a touch event. And void, break that to the next lines for readability, mark your end of that function. Trace it just to make sure that that code is running. And what this is, go to the happy ending. So I need the code here that moves me from scene to scene and such. I'll just copy and paste it from a previous, from a previously working spot. If you have it all memorized, that's impressive. But being able to just copy and paste your previously existing code is, oh, there we go. I'm going to grab it from the hall right. When I went to the bad ending, I'll just change that to the correct code. But instead of retyping and memorizing all of the other code, I'll just paste it in. So from the from the main timeline, go somewhere. The somewhere is the end good. There's another reason why the way I name my things here, I'm going to need to change its name. And, the, and if the word that needs to be changed is within the word, it's a little bit more effort about moving my mouse to the right place, deleting it the right place. If you have the part that changes the specific part at the end of the of the thing, you know, you have ending medium. It's the medium good ending or the medium bad ending. You have, it's a scene. It's one of my end scenes. It's my medium end. It's my good end. It's my bad end. That's part of that logic for how you name these. So just to confirm my scene. Scene and good. Seen and good. So I'm, I'm going to debug it in my simulator, save it, debug it. Right, so I'm going to debug it just to make sure. Start. Left, everything appears randomly. It's my third key, which I guess is the one with the little hole. Click on that one. Goes to the good ending. Now this reminds you, computers are dumb. The keys are still there. Those keys were there from the previous scene, but I'm no longer in that scene. I got to the end, I got the gold. I didn't program to remove. Now, here's something to be aware of. When you put things on the screen, they will, of course, remove themselves when you go to another scene that's built in. But when you generate stuff from the library, they will exist at all times until you deal with them. In a sense, that's a very, that's an aspect of programming known as garbage collection. Not exactly garbage collection, but uh, 
that those keys obviously shouldn't be there. Maybe I want them to appear there. If you were doing this for the assignment, I would say, why are your keys still there? And if you try to reason, uh, they're still there because you won the game and you also get the keys. No, uh, your logic is good, but for the game of it, those keys should go away. Okay, so I got to fix that. This is why you should be writing your code, saving your code, testing your code. Don't assume it all works because maybe logically the code works. But then as you are technically the code works via syntax, all the code is written properly. I didn't get any errors. But make sure logically your project works. Syntax errors, logic errors. You often get those two types of errors. And syntax errors are easy to fix. The system will probably pop up. Line seven is wrong. But logic errors. No error happened here. You have to logically deal with it. So because we've got add child, logically, there is also remove child. There is remove this thing off of the screen. So this function of going to the good ending should have a little cleanup of removing those keys off of the screen. How about before we move to the next scene, we clean up the screen and then move to the next scene. So before we move to the next scene, remove any key from screen, remove child, capital C, we have three that we generated via code. Here's just some easy the um, code to duplicate, there it is. We're no longer, they're no longer necessary in memory. So then um, remove them from the screen, then move us to the next screen. Let's see that, write the code, save the code, run the code. I go to the main gate, open the gate, break the window, go left. My coordinates are 430 by 425, 563 by 454, jumbled around. I'm at the left hallway. One of these is the correct one. Tap that, no response. Tap that one, no response. Tap that one. Go to good ending is running. I'm at the good ending. The keys are no longer jumbled spread around on the floor, cleaned up the screen. Now, again, if you further want, okay, not just this, not just I want to pick the right key, I want to pick it up and put it to the door. Well, that requires that you make the door a symbol with an instance name that then requires that you create a bounding box of this screen. Um, then write the code to detect picking up the key, moving it around. Detect when you drop the key to do hit detection. Did those two objects touch? So it'd be more code. We already did it on a previous uh, scene. So you can extrapolate from what we've done to add more. But if it works at this point, at least, that's good. That's what I'm looking for. You pick the right key. Well, where's the danger? You have all the time in the world to pick the right key. And obviously, if I have like six keys or more keys to sift through, that's even better. So now you that you know how to add keys onto the timeline, add more keys, probably. But now the danger, time's running out. Before some amount of time, spikes are going to get me. So we're going to do similar to what we did with the hallway to the right. Where here we have a time limit in the form of a timeline playing. And after X amount of frames, if we hit that final frame, it will um, be game over. So within X amount of time, person has to select the right key. 
We'll start it with just uh, maybe just two seconds. That'll be way too short, but just to start off, two seconds. So frame 50 or so, have, have your background layer exist up to frame 50, have your actions exist up to frame 50, F5. I'm going to make a, I'm going to have a layer that's just a uh, hallway or background or whatever. And then another layer that is spikes. Wraps or whatever. The, the, the art of uh, anticipation is one that is, takes time to, to learn and master. So you would think, I want the spikes to, to happen. I know in my mind, I know I want spikes to happen. But you probably want a little bit of a pause to see, oh, I'm in a brand new screen. What do I do here? Then we start stuff happening, the, the, the animations of the spikes and such. So we'll say one second. You can refine it as you feel what looks good on your game. But we're going to say, show this screen for one second and then stuff starts to happen so on frame 24 the first second f7 on my spikes move forward from here spikes will start to happen uh, i'm going to animate them very very simply previously we were doing a keyframe and then a frame and then a keyframe then a frame so we were animating on twos uh, two frames were taking up one bit of animation uh, i'm going to do this in fives uh, one frame and then five frames later, the next frame, and then five frames later, the next frame and the next frame. So five, 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 five. So starting on 25 here, uh, some spikes will appear. This is where, again, on your own game, your own creativity uh, will really shine. But the way I'm going to do mine is uh, like the very first tips of these spikes are going to start to appear. And just to be completely simple, um, it's going to be these dots. So spikes will start to appear from these spots in the wall. And I can start from the roof and the left and whatever. I can make a I can make the floors gonna fall out. So maybe I can start to draw the outline of you know the floor. Suddenly a floor appears. And then on the next frame, well, it's gonna open up a little bit more and then open up a little bit more. And I start to see lava down there. You can be very, 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 very creative in all of this. I'm just showing here that in X amount of frames, something's gonna happen. And if you don't get to the time limit, game over. So five frames later, which is less than half a second, F6. So now I'm gonna make a little bit of spikes starting to come out. Yeah, incredibly simple, just these little lines. They're not even sharp. Yeah, I could draw them as, um, I could draw them in the, uh, I could draw them as symbols in the um, library. I, I probably, for better animation, should have them different sizes. Things that are further away are going to have a thinner line. Things that are closer up will have a thicker line. I don't know if it really, really, really feels like spikes. Again, I can refine all of this if I have all the time. Jump five more frames over, F6. Add to these. Just again, I don't know, just make them longer out. Whatever amount of time I want all of this danger to be happening in. It's going hallways normal. Something's coming, coming out further, coming out further. Five more frames. Six. Now, however you draw these things, if they overlap, it gives you more of a sense of perspective. You have elements overlapping other elements. And I, if I want to further think harder about what's 
what's in perspective. The things closer should probably, these spikes should probably be very thick like this. Draw them now, uh, draw them properly frame by frame. But now these are coming out even further out. <laughs> Five more frames over, and I guess this will be the end. So they went all the way across. So obviously with music and sound effects, you put, the, you put the fine details of it and it really comes to life. The game's been silent up to this point. We still got the final thing is uh, music, but then that puts the, the icing on the cake. And um, a little bit of a pause. So once again here, the ideas of, I know in my mind what's happening, we're in the room, then suddenly spikes, and then we're dead. Well, we want a little pause to get a sense of we're dead. So if I just ended everything here at two seconds, that's not enough pause. So probably at least one more second. So all of these frames will be visible up to frame 75 or so, F5. So after these come out here, they come out, they get us paused, we're dead. And then it takes us to the next scene adding a little time before and after is a valuable skill. It doesn't seem, until you see it over and over and over, do you realize that, that the pause, that the little bit of extra time, um, breathing room and such is so important. And at the end, frame 75 on my actions layer, F7 to add some new code. So we have the original code at the beginning that is running. The playhead gets to the final frame, 75. So now at the very end there, take us to the bad ending. So time's up. Trace that if you want. Uh, didn't find the key. Us to the right place. movie clip go to and play being bad and clean up the keys so remember that if we get to the if we find the right key and go to the good ending we had to remove the keys before going to the good ending if we don't remove the keys here we'll have the keys when we go to the bad ending so Remove child, all those keys in memory. Copy and paste. Sometimes copy and paste is faster than writing it. And now we have an element of danger. We have a time limit. We have something interactive on the screen within X amount of times. And I'll run this as the full game. Sometimes you're able to test a scene just to see if the basic skeletons of it work, the basics of the system work. And then other times you have to run through your whole game. 
and you might pick up on elements you didn't realize um, was played. Actually, this also reminds me, uh, right now it's, we're very obviously, click on the left, click on the right. In a moment, uh, we'll, we'll refine this a little bit more. I'll come back to that, I had an idea there. So go to the left, here's my, okay, I guess there's some keys here, I guess I should pick one up. Um, oops, didn't I make spikes appear? Why are the spikes not appearing? Just programmed it to animate to give spikes. Well, that reminds us that we have a stop. As soon as we get to this scene, stop here. So that was useful at this point when we came from a previous scene as we were coding it little by little. But now that we're on this scene, we need it to play. So comment that out or delete it. We want that to, we want that to um, actually play. So now before I test it again, what I was saying about the main hallway, we have this very obvious click places to click. Depending how you make your game, the objects, you could draw them as um, parts of your background and make them clickable as we've seen, or as long as there is some sort of shape to click on, you can use that and put it transparent. And even though it's not gonna be visible, it's still gonna be interactive. So think about this. I'm gonna go back to my hallway. I've got two objects here, which are movie clips. They have their own instance name. And if I fade them out to zero or a very, very, very low opacity, even at zero, they're still interactive. So select your left object over on the properties of the object under color effect. We have alpha. Drag that down to zero or one if you want. Uh, I'm gonna have it at a very, very low. I'm gonna have one of them very, very low just so that as I'm testing it, I know where to click. But I'm gonna set that alpha down to, I don't know, 5%, let's say. As you're working on your own game and testing your own game and such, you don't make it harder on yourself. Like right there, uh, I know something is clickable because it's at 5%. So as I'm working on the game, I have things very, very low. And then maybe when I finish the game, I put them to zero, or maybe I still keep them very, very, very low, 1%, let's say. That might be a little hint as people play. So the point of this is that you can have things that are literally a, the object that you're interacting with. It's a symbol. Or you can have elements in your design that are just shapes to click on with zero alpha and they're still interactive. Now, that. Beat, rock left or right, left, there we go, one second, oh, spikes are coming, whoops, I didn't even realize what happened, and now I'm in the dead zone, the bad ending, and the keys are not there. They would have been there if I didn't program removing the keys before going to the next scene. This then reminds us, one more thing to do today, well, okay, I'm stuck here. What I can click exit and, and animate, but when this is a real game on a real device, what are you gonna do then? You're, you're gonna program starting over or ending the game. So let me, play, let me play it again. This time go to the good ending. So I've got three seconds to figure out what do I need to do here and pick up the right. I think the, the, the time limit is way too short, but I'm just showing as a starting point, what it is, and then you can refine it. So start, gate, rock, go left. Where's the key? There's the key, get it, get it. Oops, not fast enough. 
No, actually, yes, fast enough, which reminds me one more thing. So I did click the correct key. It did take me to the, to the right ending. The spike still came at me. Forgot to do one more thing. Stopped the timeline from playing, similar to the mini boss. The boss is coming at us, defeated the boss, stopped the timeline so that we don't hit the bad ending. We need to stop the timeline of the spikes. I got the good ending, but it felt like the spikes were still coming. That's easy, just like the mini boss um, scene in the left hallway. So you see this go to good ending does a lot. It's removing stuff from the screen. It's moving us. And one more thing here. It's in the order of things. Stop the timeline. Whenever the person clicks on a key, timeline, keys from the screen, move me to the good ending. This, these are the little bits of polish that you add to the project as you debug it, as you test it as you get other people to, to, to check out your game, where they have completely zero knowledge of your game, you know your game inside and out. Have other people check it out, observe them how they play it, mental or actual notes on what could be improved. Then it did it. It went to the good ending. And so, um, Good ending, bad ending. Right, so in the good ending or the bad ending, we uh, then want the option to start over or uh, end the game. We'll see how to do that right now. And once you see this, you can then uh, apply it to any point in the game where if you want the option to start or restart, then of course, we get into, well, can I, can I do a save and come back to it later and save states and all that stuff? Of course, everything can be done. It's just, do you have the time? Do you have the deadlines and so forth? So uh, good ending, bad ending. So on the good ending, we're going to set ourselves up to exit the game. And that is a little bit of code. So it's code that, uh, it's partly code that we've seen before and uh, new code. So let's see about the library here. Uh, in the beginning, uh, when we first started to learn all of this, right, we made these buttons, okay, title, start, 
button, title button, start, title button, help. Um, we had the help screen, help back. We could put, we, we, now that we know, we could have put all of the various buttons in one symbol and then display the symbol as necessary on screen via the code. Even if we drop in an instance onto the screen, if the first frame, if, uh, if the button has 10 frames and we put it onto the screen, we can still use the code to say, actually show frame three. But here, uh, I'm going to create some buttons, uh, start the game over. So we'll have quit and we'll have um, start over. We'll have exit or, or replay, exit and replay. Now, um, I feel like drawing it new or you could use previously existing ones. Draw a new one. So in the good ending, block some layers, make a new layer. I'm going to draw. Button. Replay. I'll improve the button later, but this, I need to turn it into a symbol. You can double click all of that to select it all, draw a little selection. So I'm gonna get that, turn it into a symbol F8. This will be, I, I don't need this advanced part. You can leave it open or close if you want. Um, this one will be, uh, we'll call this ending. And, Replay. ETN replay. Once it's an object in the library, I'll duplicate it and button exit. Refine it, put it on screen, then we'll code it. But now we've got an object on the screen uh, because the um, action script will want to detect that that has been pressed while I while I have it here before I move on. Uh, up on the um, properties, give that a name. TN. This um, replay VTN, my ending scene, the good ending, replay button. I need an exit button, quit the game button. So in the library, I am going to duplicate, right click to duplicate my replay button, duplicate, that will be end BTN uh, exit or quit. So a replay button, an exit button, change that up a little bit. I'm gonna flip it over, symmetry. Modify, transform, flip horizontal. Draw their exit.
So I'll drag and drop a copy of the exit button somewhere onto the screen. Sit. This has the instance name and good replay button. This needs its own instance name. So the JavaScript knows which is which. And end good exit button. This is part of the repetition of uh, programming a game. Uh, we've seen how to make buttons, how to make them interactive. We've seen how to move from screen to screen. Uh, so the replay will take us back to uh, the title screen. Now, this is where you can decide to take you back to the gate or to take you back to the um, title screen. Or let's say you get to the bad ending you can have it take you back one screen back to where you died, the main screen where you died or where you back that you died. That's a little more complex in that you need to tr keep track of, somehow keep track of what was the last screen I was in. This is too advanced for the moment, but we could be tracking what screen, how far along are we in the, in the game in that at the very beginning of the game, again, I'm not gonna delve too far into it, but at the very beginning of the game, we could have a variable um, called something like current scene. And here we can keep track via numerically or the name of the scene. We could be keeping track when we click and go to a place. Every time we click, we reset the variable to a new scene name. So it's going to remember, you're going to be remembering your last screen in a variable. And therefore, when we, um, when we jump between scenes and such, the uh, current screen or whatever we call it, last scene or whatever, we could use that to then know where to take us the last time if we, if we died. So consider uh, a tracker of progress. The name of the scene, the, name, the, what the value in the variable is the name of the scene, which will make it easy then when you do the code to go to and play. Well, instead of a scene here, it would be the variable. We can tell it to a variable. And this variable is keeping track of what scene you're on. So this is for consideration uh, to keep track of your progress. So the uh, good end code is basically based on previous code for um, moving around. We did that a couple times, so we'll do it again. Good ending. Need some code. We're clicking on something. It's going to run some code. Um, definition of that some code is right there. The um, trace will say something. The actual do the thing is going to be taking us somewhere. So some code like that. And we have uh, two instances of that for the replay and the exit. So a little more copy and paste. But anyway, this one, I called it end good replay. So copy and paste it. It's going to go to FN. Uh, to 
um, replay. Now we do have over on the um, help, we had a code to go back. We already had go to go to title scene uh, because this code exists. We could repurpose existent code. I could tell it again, just use this function that already exists, which is already set up to go back to the title. I could do that. Or if I need other things to also happen, well, this function here is only designed to take us back from help, so it works fine. If from an ending, I just need to go back to title, then yeah, I could repurpose it and use it. But if I need to do other things like set variables and remove things from the screen and such, I would definitely want a new unique function to, to deal with all of that. So sometimes you can reuse existing code if you know it works exactly at all instances, but many times you're creating new code, it's doing new things. Like right here, actually not take me to title, but take me directly to the gate. This is up to you to decide. Uh, replay back at the gate or replay back at the, at the title screen. If I go back to the title screen so that the person can go to help, maybe under help, you have a little bit more tips where you write there, try tapping some things, try dragging other things, uh, you know, actually give some help on the help screen. This will take us back to the um, title screen. Now, to exit the game, Going to be very similar code except one one line. This line here is going to be very different. But besides that, then uh, go to exit or exit game, just exit game. This is, this is brand new here. Uh, all of this other code is moving from screen to screen, scene to scene and such. Uh, this one's very, very different. So um, we can say unique code to exit the app, the game. So we have here native, capital N, application, capital A. We have a whole bunch of code. And this is in the, all, all everything that we've been learning is basically coming out of code snippets. Uh, there are shortcuts in there, of course, but we're doing it the long way. And I think it's valuable when you learn something, do it the long way the first time to understand it somewhat. And then after that, um, shortcuts. But there's a whole bunch of native app code like, um, what if I, uh, you know, what if I lower the volume or raise the volume on my device? Or what if I access the camera and all of that stuff? So we have all of this capability that you can do based on it being an actual app on a device. And what I want here is another, this one's native application, spelled differently, but it's just the way it is when this was uh, when this was invented. So capital N on the first, lowercase on the second, native application, then dot exit, parentheses, zero. It's just the way it is. This uh, code right here uh, exits the game. For the full effect, I'm gonna run this on my real device. But here's the code start over or take me back to the main, the main uh, game or exit the whole game. So debug that on my real device, device.
So it comes up on the game here. There's my console at the bottom. So I'll go to start. I'm at main, click the gate. I'm at the front door, tap the door for fun. The door's wiggling, pick up the rock, <laughs> toss the rock at the window. I'm at the hallway, main hallway. I have the transparency versus the visible, the completely invisible one. I go to the left, get the right key, got the key. So uh, at the hallway, those are the coordinates, 21, blah, blah, blah. I clicked it in time, go in, go to good ending. So I'm at the good ending. So I've got play, replay and exit. So hit replay, hit that, takes me back to the gate. It says I'm at main. So try it again. This time I'll go to quit the app. Go left, grab the right key. Where is it? There it is. Uh, so I'm at the good ending and I'll tap exit. And then it quit it off of the device here. And then it also shut down my debugging. So now we have the capability to end the game off of the device. And this is the code right here. So that's obvious. We've done that over and over and over. Go to a place. This is brand new. Exit the app. But the rest of it works the same. So like I've said before, now you know. So you should probably do that on the on the bed end. Put the buttons there. Give them instance names um, and the code. So if you did it right on this screen, you should be able to do it right on that screen. So I won't do it. You need to do it uh, to be able to exit that screen. In the totality of things, we still have the music. The music will be the last thing to so just give the final polish. Not a very long game, of course. We've been spending a few weeks on this. We can still spend a few more months on this. We can still add a whole bunch of cool things, inventory and more bosses and more screens way more, it's a never ending thing. That's sometimes what happens with game designers, especially when you're an indie game designer, you yourself, I got so many ideas and all the time in the world and therefore your game is never finished. There was just an article that I heard recently that someone literally spent 20 years trying to make their game and they finally released it because um, you always have these ideas. And uh, if you don't have a time limit, that's one of the, it's not, the intelligence and such, it's time limit. If you don't have a time limit, then it'll never get done. So our time limit is way more short than I would like, of course, way more short than what you would like, but our time limit is sixth. So one more lecture on Wednesday to add sound, background sound, sound as you interact with elements, and then the game is done. Obviously not really, but done enough for this class. And you know the haunted house motif, is probably not your motif from your movie. How are you going to change my motif to your, to your motif in time? And the code works. Remember, the code is the important part that will work, that needs to work for the final, not how, how, not how beautiful it looks. The beautiful part is not part of the grading. The code and it working is the grading. We have one final lab on Wednesday. We have a lab today, a little bit, and the lab on Wednesday, and then we're done. If you uh, can come in in person to get help, that's the best thing. Do it, getting help online is a little harder, but it can be done via Zoom. But if you're here in person, we can uh, help you even better. So we'll end at this point. I'll upload my example code so far. I'll upload the lecture later on. We'll have a little bit of lab time if you want to stay and work and such. And then we'll, um, we'll wrap up.